Hello and welcome to today's episode of Turning Readers into Writers, in which I'm talking to Devon J. Hall about a series of essays she's published about her life called Uncomfortable, short, unedited essays from the loud mouth brown girl. She talks to me about how she started writing, how she balances all the different elements of her life and the objectives for each writing session that she has. She talks about which writers have inspired her and how she does not like the idea of writers not thinking they're good enough and not being able to overcome that fear. She also has some lovely ideas of how we can tap into our creativity, tap into our memories, and it has echoes of Julia Cameron, so well worth listening to. If you're interested in writing your own memoir or perhaps some narrative non-fiction, this episode is a must for you. So let's dive in. Welcome to the Turning Readers into Writers podcast, where we teach beginner writers how to find the time and the confidence to write their first novel. I'm your host, Emma Desi, and I'm very excited that you're here. Thank you for joining me today, because if you've been longing to write your novel for forever, then this is the place to be. Think of this as your weekly dose of encouragement, of handholding and general cheerleading as you figure out how you're going to write your first novel. Trust me, as a mum of three young kids, I know how tricky it can be to tuck some time aside for yourself on a regular basis. And even when you do find that spare five minutes, you can feel so overwhelmed that no writing gets done. Trust me, I have been there, but this podcast is going to help you in practical ways because once a week I'll be delivering an episode that gives you steps to building a writing routine, encouragement to build your confidence and cheerleading until you reach the end. Okay, let's start. Well, Devin, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really delighted to have you here. I wonder if we could just start with you telling us a little bit about yourself, um, because I know that you've got quite a few strings to your bow. You've got a website that you run as well. So you're not you're not just a writer, but you also run the Loudmouth Brown Girl website as well. Can you tell us about that? So um, Loudmouth Brown Girl started because I was on a I was volunteering at CGSF Radio here in Canada. And I, they sent me on a work trip and it was my first adult trip and I was really excited to go. And I got there and everybody around me was drinking and I don't drink. And so it was very difficult to kind of make some real connections with people, with folks. And there was a lot of racism in the town that we were in. And I had never, like somebody actually came up to me and said, you're black. And I was like, yeah, I know. I, this is not news to me. <laughs> um, and so there was a lot of stuff like that where it was just overt, like somebody broke into my room and there was all kinds of stressors and triggers. And then on my way home, I had a panic attack mm-hmm. and I got arrested for having the panic attack and forced to go to the hospital and had to deal with doctors and take a bus home. And I came home and I was just angry. Mm-hmm. And I thought the cop called me a loud mouth brown bee. And I remember telling him I was going to make that the most famous brand in the world. (laughs) And I was so, I was so galvanized that I just started writing about everything that had happened on the trip and everything that I had been through. And the more I started writing, the more everything started coming out. The abuses from when I was a child and dealing with an abusive priest and white supremacy and on and on and on. And I realized very quickly that I didn't just want it to be an anti-rape site. I wanted it to be something that actually helps people and where they could come to it and have it be a resource. And so it's definitely in the last two years evolved from just being a blog about my experience to my blog about my experience as a black woman living in a country that is just starting to understand that we actually do have a race problem and that has a huge effect on our mental health mm-hmm. as a society. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And because I, I think when I was looking on the website, you are inviting other people to come in. I don't know if it's predominantly women, but you're, you're looking for submissions from other writers. Is that correct? 
Yes, we're looking for submissions from other brown girls. And I use the term brown girl very loosely. If you have brown hair and you are a loud mouth and you don't care what people think about you, we want you to submit your work. We want it to be a place where other brown girls can come together and share their experience and their story. And it was always meant to be that. It was always meant to be a collective. So now we're looking for people to come and share about what their experience is trying to be a writer or what their experience is with politics, or maybe it's about sexual abuse. Maybe it's about marijuana use, whatever it may be, Mm -hmm. as long as it's from your perspective and your voice. Fantastic. Well, I'll definitely put a link to that in the show notes for if anyone's cool. interested in uh, putting in a submission. Now, you've you've um, touched on it before that you've experienced a lot of abuse in your life. And I think that's one of the, the reasons that you wrote your book called Uncomfortable, Short Unedited Essays from the Loudmouth Brown Girl. And so I just because it's a, a series of essays, I wasn't sure how you would describe it. Do you feel about it that it is a memoir? Oh, I don't know if it's a memoir because I don't go into deal into detail about my abuse stories. Um, and I specifically don't do that because I don't want to contribute to what I call trauma porn. Um, but it is definitely about some of the lessons that I learned and the, the experiences that I've had that have brought me to be where I am today. So I stick with just it's a book of essays because that's sort of what fits. Okay. Okay. So, um, but based based on your life, so maybe some kind of be sort of um, uh, creative nonfiction. Like that's that? better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's better. So, um, when we've spoken before, re- before we started recording, you mentioned that these stories just sort of came pouring out of you. This was just something that had to be written. And so, how did you get started with your writing? When I got home from having the panic attack, I could feel another one coming and I knew I was going to have an emotional breakdown. So I went to my friend and I said, give me weed. And she said, you don't smoke weed. And I said, no, I don't. Give me weed. And it was specifically because I knew that it was coming and I needed something to balance me out, to help. And I had thought about, seriously thought about drinking because I was at that point where I was like, I need something to dull the pain. Mm -hmm. And she said, this is not going to dull the pain. It's going to force you to deal with it. And as it turns out, it really did. I had a long conversation with my mom. I said, this is what I had been through. Um, And once I was able to say it out loud, there was about a three day period where she went away And I stood in my house and I looked around and I said, no one's home. And I started screaming and I started screaming about all the things that had happened to me and how unfair it was and how miserable I was and poor me and on and on it went. And then I heard a voice say, okay, now go write about it. And I sat down and I started writing and everything just came out. And it was such a release of emotional baggage that I'd been holding on to. It was like, this is what I needed. This is... People say that marijuana is the drug, but for me, it's the writing is the drug. Like, that's what I need Mm -hmm. every day. I don't need marijuana every day anymore, but I do need to be writing every day. Um, And so that's kind of how it it started. I I don't think that I would be writing. I think I'd still be painting um, if I hadn't hadn't started smoking pot. And I don't recommend it for everybody. It's certainly not for people under the age of 18 and those with severe mental health issues. It's just that that's what worked for me. It opened the floodgates. I'm just trying to think, you know, for our listeners who might be going through something similar or have been through something similar, you know, a difficult time in their life and they're wanting to write about it. Did you, at that time when you started writing, did you have any idea of structure at that time or was it literally just an outpouring that whatever came into your mind you put down on paper? I had a little bit of structure. I want to say that it was a complete outpouring, um, but it mostly it was, it was, yeah, it was, there was a little bit of like, it has to be an essay format. 
because this is what I'm comfortable writing. Um, it has to be under a certain amount of words because I don't want to drone on and on and on. There's only so much you can say about a specific topic before you start repeating yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a little bit of structure, but for the most part, it was just write what you need to write today and see how you feel about it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And the more that I wrote, the more I was like, okay, I don't actually hate the essays I wrote yesterday. I'll leave them for now. And then before I knew it, I was publishing it. And I remember everyone was all excited for me and I was still sitting there going, I'm not quite sure how that happened. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I really admire that. I think it's um, a lot of people are very scared to press publish and um, will procrastinate a lot and put up a lot of barriers against doing that, you know, for understandable fears. So I love that you kind of, just decided no I've got to do this this is it came from the heart and it had to be put out into the world and um and now you're sharing your story with or elements of your story with a lot of other people who will need to hear it um, so I really admire that thank you and so um when you sat down to write those essays did you have an objective for each writing session was it perhaps to write a certain number of words you know you've mentioned you didn't want to go too long on each essay or do you find it better to um, have a set period of time or do you just kind of as the muse takes you you just write um, for as long as I you just can. write as the muse takes me I would love to say that I'm structured and organized and that everything is where it needs to be in my house but that's just not the case I thrive in chaos um, when I sit down to write it's it's there's a feeling that comes over you like you know this is it this is the one right now I'm writing an essay about my journey with smoking weed and writing and I just know that this is going to be in the book because this isn't a story that I've told before and it just feels right. Mm -hmm. And that's how you know. Mm -hmm. It's a gut instinct for you. It, it absolutely is. Mm -hmm. And so um, that, mm -hmm. I, I was going to ask, you know, wh whether you plot or you pant, if you're a plotter or a pantster, but it sounds to me like that you're more of a, a pantster that you just go with your gut and whatever comes on the page you can mold it after after you've written it yeah absolutely and it's the it's that's what makes writing fun is that it's a bit of an adventure because I never know what's going to come out mm -hmm. um I have a fictional blog that I'm working on as well and I call it my um it's sort of like my writer's workbook this is where you can go to learn about the characters and the backstory and the hope is that one day that I'll actually write a book based on this fictional blog but um the idea is that it's my way of actually plotting out the storylines. And so I'm training myself how to be a plotter, but in my nonfiction writing, I'm definitely just like whatever comes, it's emotional and literal diarrhea of thought. And it's, it's a beautiful way of seeing how I change my format depending on whether I'm writing fiction or nonfiction. So I love that idea that you, um, <laughs> as a way to become a plotter you're actually blogging about your your characters and their backstory and so do you also um are you putting in kind of plot points as well and seeing how people respond to those yeah um there's like this whole society of women who rule the world in the shadows they're called Kriohana there's this part where it's because all the blog posts are written from the character's perspective. So one character, for instance, she's about ready to become queen of the society. And so she has to go on this trip to all the other tribes and get their approval before she can ascend the throne. And so it's neat because I'm sitting here and I'm like, that's interesting. What if some of the characters aren't happy that other characters are going on the trip and there's Goyas, which are outsiders, and it's very gypsy based. And so it's really allowing me to stretch my muscles when it comes to fiction writing, because I'm starting to see that like this, as the story is unfolding, it's just coming to a natural head. And that's really cool to watch. Well, that's nice. You can feel the, the kind of tension and everything building naturally. Yeah. Oh, I like that. That sounds a great story. The lo I love the kind of gypsy element. Lots of room for sort of colour and music and, and feel yeah. things like that. Lots of sort of texture. 
Yeah, that's what I love about it the most. My mom is actually um, gypsy, and so that's where the story came from. It's something I've always thought about. I've been working on it since I was a kid, and now I'm like, actually coming together. <laughs> <laughs> wow, well, that's interesting. It's because you mentioned before that she's from the UK, but now she, yes. she's in Canada, so she really has gone traveling and um, uh not just within Britain, but uh, taking her gypsy, her gypsy need to travel uh, abroad. She's definitely her. gypsy. She's <laughs> got all the traits, can't sit still. She's very vibrant, loves the colors and the shoes and the bling. Like she's very, she won't admit it because a lot of English people don't want to talk about gypsies, but she's very much got the gypsy spirit inside of her. Oh, good. She's, she's held on to it. Good for her. Absolutely. Um, now, I did want to um, ask you a little bit about the structure of the story, of the book and the different essays. And I wondered um, how you decided upon that when you were kind of looking at the different essays you had. Did you, was there a narrative that you wanted to follow or um, perhaps there were different kind of topics that you wanted to divide it into? How did you go about um, organising the structure of your book? I didn't. <laughs> I have absolutely no organizational structure whatsoever. I do with my second book, the one that I'm working on now, there's definitely um in the in uncomfortable there's about five pages of helpline phone numbers. And so the second book kind of continues on where that ends. And it starts with an essay about why I choose not to commit suicide and why I am choosing to fight with my fight for my life. Um, and that was very intentional because I very much wanted to feel like these two books were connected. Mm -hmm. This book is going to be a lot more uplifting than the last book, I think, because it's going to be a lot more about personal power. Um, and so there'll be a lot more organi organizational structure to this one than there was the last one. But what, yeah, what for the first the, one. Sorry, I was just going to ask, what, was, what would you say, you've, you've said that the second book is more uplifting, it's about... Um, being more empowered what would you say was kind of the theme um or then perhaps the underlying message of the first book of uncomfortable chaos absolute undiluted chaos um and i say that not joking because i was in such a chaotic space when i wrote the book um artists are like that when we are feeling emotionally unbalanced and we're creating at the same time, we don't necessarily know, especially like if you're a painter or something, who somebody who doesn't write, does not create with words, um, it's very abstract. And I think that uncomfortable is very abstract. It, there's, it kind of jumps all over the place and there's different topics. It's not about one specific theme, yeah. um, which is kind of cool because most self-help books are they have a theme and they have a structure whereas uncomfortable is like it's the Devin Hall version of John Malkovich's mind <laughs> <laughs> I like it I like it you should send him a copy and tell him that <laughs> I should Kim Rhodes compared it to the um the body moves exhibit, which is like the dead bodies without the skin. Mm -hmm. She was like, your book is the psychic equivalent of that. And I went, is that a good thing? <laughs> and she's like, no, it's amazing. And I love it. And she was wonderful about it. But uh, I guess <laughs> only a television demon slayer could come up with such a comparison. So I would like to move on to um, writers that have inspired you. It sounds like you've been writing for um, a little while now. Um, and so what, what writers have inspired you, not necessarily to, to write this book of essays, but just generally, um, uh, who have you read that you've enjoyed and you've thought, yes, I, I can do that too? Um, J.D. Robb or Nora Roberts is one of my favorite writers of all time. I think that she, she does, in her Nora Roberts, she writes a lot of, trilogies and so everything is love and magic and how you need the power of three and all that kind of stuff and then as jd robb she writes very scientific very futuristic very sci-fi kind of stuff and so the two, the fact that she writes so differently in two different genres and she's successful at both equally um has always made me go like i could do that 
I could I could write in in more than one genre. I don't have to stick to just memoirs. I don't have to stick to just fiction. I can do a little bit of both. Mm-hmm. Kim Harrison is my favorite of all time. I bow to the altar that is Kim Harrison. She writes uh, a series of books, and I, for the life of me, I can't remember it right now. But they're a, it's about a demon hunter and fairies, and there's demons and angels and two different kinds of worlds that she's brought together into one. And she's just funny and effervescent. And I talk to her on Twitter all the time. And I swear I feed her ego, but I'm it's worth it. Um, Joss Whedon, I don't know if you guys have Buffy out there. But Buffy Joss Vampire Whedon, Slayer. yeah, yeah, he wrote a line for Angel, and it goes, uh, "Live as if the world were what it should be to show it what it can be." Mm-hmm. And the first time I heard those words, I like audibly gasped, and I was like, "That's that's what I want people to feel when they read my writing." Like that that moment of oh my god, that is profound and beautiful and heartbreaking, and that whole scene was just so, it was everything that I wanted in a vampire show about a a man who loves his son and wants to see his son succeed and be the best of humanity. And it was just like, that's the kind of writer that I wanted to be. That was the moment that I knew I was going to be a writer because I had to, my goal is to make enough money to meet Joss Whedon and say, thank you. That's it. Like, that's it. I know he's a white guy and I'm a black chick and we're supposed to like hate each other or whatever. But when somebody makes you feel a moment of, oh my God, like I want to cry just thinking about that scene and all the people that that came together to make that happen. Mm -hmm. I want that moment. I want to be standing on my own film set and be like, (laughs) it's my character just said that. And somebody is going to hear that and feel that. And yeah, those are my three favorites. Well, that's a, and that's a, quite a nice um, broad spectrum there from yeah. Nora Roberts, who kind of writes about love and romance and uh, positive things from all the way through to vampires. and um, the I love it all. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, a lot of beginner writers in particular, I think maybe this is something that we all struggle with, but when you're starting out, it can really, really feel very intense. And, and it's that idea of not being good enough. Um, and I'm wondering at the beginning or even now perhaps do you ever worry about that and if you do you know how do you find a way to either live with it or push it to one side those kind of um, feelings of insecurity that um, comparisonitis that we often get that we're not good enough to be writing this book we're not good enough um, or we'll I never hate be that. comparison. I hate that mentality and I have divorced it um I think because I'm such a stubborn pain in the butt and because I'm English and Irish and Scottish and Jamaican. And I genuinely believe that because I'm like, these cultures are some of the most stubborn cultures on the planet and they're all a part of who I am. Um, I used to say I was born to drink because I'm English, Irish, Scottish and Jamaican. And now I say I'm born to create because I come from such amazing cultures that are filled with art and love and philosophy and romance. And I mean, like what's more romantic than Scotland in the summer? Nothing, (laughs) nothing. And that's where I come from. I come from those people. Right. And my mom, she's, she lives in a wheelchair. And I remember once I won this contest for her where she got to go pick out a pair of shoes And I remember thinking, like, those are too high. She'll never be able to walk in them. And she goes, I don't have to walk in them. I just have to look pretty because that's what makes me feel good. Writing makes me feel the way that she feels when she's dressed up, right? It makes me feel powerful and secure. And I know that I do it well because I've had people say to me, you're part of my healing journey or your work has really helped me. But more than that, it's helped me. And it sounds really selfish, but I don't write for other people. I don't write because I want to make people feel good about themselves. I write because I need to write to live. It's it's how I exist. Mm -hmm. So the idea of being insecure about, excuse me, about my writing, it just doesn't occur to me. Like it, it, I don't care if Joss Whedon hates my writing. He doesn't have to like it. 
I like my writing. I'm proud of the content that I put out there because I know where it comes from. I know how much pain I've endured to get where I'm getting. So to anybody who sits there and goes, I'm not good enough or nobody cares, there is somebody in the world that needs your story besides yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the thing that we forget. Our experiences are meant to be shared. They're meant to be um, passed along to the next generation, the next group of people so that they can say, okay, well, Devin went through this. This is what she learned. That's what I'm learning from what she's learned. And you know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. we're supposed to be sharing information with each other to make it easier. So I feel like saying the days where I'm like, I'm not good enough or I'm a hack which I went through when I wrote Uncomfortable. As soon as I published it, I was like, this is terrible. It's never going to sell. Everyone's going to hate it. I started crying. I like, I curled in a ball and I was like, I'm such a hack. I'm such a loser. And then three days later, I sold 18 copies. And I was like, okay, what would have happened if I hadn't, if I hadn't tried? I would have sold no copies, right? So it's better to sell one than it is to sell nothing. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important message for people is that it's you've got to try you've got to do it and see how it goes and not get to a point where you kick yourself and think oh I never even tried what was why didn't I even try it's um because once you do it I'm a really big believer that once you write that first draft it can really change your life and either you're going to know that okay this isn't for me Or you're going to know, I love this writing. I'm passionate about this. It fulfills me in a a way that nothing else does. And then you'll have the bug and you'll carry on from there. But I do feel that one of the most important things is just to complete that first draft to give yourself that chance to make a decision from there. Honestly, the thing that I've learned, I, for this new book, I started writing it the day after Chadwick Boseman died. And so for black people, that's kind of like, I don't want to say he's like our black Jesus, but he's pretty close. You know what I mean? Like he, he matters that much to people. And I read over what I was writing last night and I started to cry. And that was the moment where I realized like beyond anything else that I thought I could do this. When I read my own writing and I started to cry, I was like, I was born to be a writer. And I think People think that when you have those moments of, I can't do this and I suck and it's terrible and and you start crying about it, I feel like people think that's a bad thing. That's a great thing because you're releasing all of that negativity so that you can start making room for the idea that maybe you can do this, you just have to try, Mm -hmm. like you said. Mm -hmm. I love it I love it um again kind of another one of the questions I was going to ask you but I think you've you've sort of answered it really is I'm very much a believer that there is an audience for every story out there and it sounds like that's something you feel as well that we have stories to share and it's almost our duty to share them it it absolutely is I feel like keeping your story to yourself when you've experienced trauma and we've all experienced trauma. It, the degree that, of trauma doesn't matter. Every human on earth has experienced some kind of trauma mm-hmm. is in a, in a way very selfish because there is somebody out there that needs to hear your story, whether it's the 14-year-old kid down the street or the African girl on the other side of the planet wondering if she's ever going to make it as a writer. There's somebody out there that needs your story. And I don't think we have the right to keep them to ourselves. I think it's important that we share them because that's how this is that's how society grows it's how we evolve mm-hmm. is through the that's sharing a, of stories yeah no that's a really lovely way of reframing that it's um it's not that you're being self-indulgent to tell your story it's that you're helping somebody else by telling your story I yeah love that. absolutely yeah. so you've um you've mentioned that you're writing another book and so this one is going to be uh a more uplifting read you've said um how far are you along with it now how is it coming along I just started, so it's brand new. Um, it's brand new. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to say too much about it. So and so, I, I don't know what to say about it yet because it hasn't it hasn't unfolded yet. Okay. I haven't figured out what the story is behind the stories yet. Okay, so it'll merge organically. That's right. And um, I wondered if you have any sort of uh, words of advice or. 
um, something that you would suggest to any anybody out there who's thinking about writing their their memoir about a period that was difficult for them what would be your words of encouragement to help them get started Ooh, easy question because <laughs> it's different for everybody um for me and again this goes back to using marijuana medicinally for me when I first started thinking about writing uncomfortable one of the, the other things that I did was I, I I don't live too far from Vancouver I'm about 45 minutes away and so I spent a lot of time just wandering through Vancouver drinking a lot of Starbucks coffee probably more than it's good for me um and just spending, I spent time just getting to know myself. And so I would go on these dates and I would take myself for coffee and go for gelato and go for lunch. And people might think that that's not part of the writing process, but it really was very much about spending time getting to know my own mind. I would talk to myself out loud. I'd plug in my headphones and listen to music and have full blown conversations about the things that I wanted to write because it was sort of my way of bouncing ideas off of my own head and, and, you know, what do you think about if I wrote this? And what do you think if I wrote about that? And just expressing all of the things that I wanted to write about. And it was very much like talking to my very own best friend. I recommend doing that. I recommend taking yourself out on dates, getting to know who you are outside of your husband, your wife, your partner, your kids, your friends, spend time with who you are as an individual because you can't write about the hard stuff unless you start thinking about all the good stuff that came with the hard stuff. Um, yeah, it really sucks that I got arrested, but as a result of getting arrested, I started this amazing website. I wrote a book. I'm writing a second book. Good things have happened on top of that. And that's made it easier to sit down and write about the, the tough stuff. Mm -hmm. that's lovely advice wonderful advice I've never heard anybody else give that before the idea well of I'm crazy yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's I, I love it it's um there's somebody I follow called Joanna Penn and I think she would sort of liken that to f uh, refilling your creative well by taking yourself out taking time out go to a gallery as you say go for coffee go for a walk yeah just spend time getting to know who you are. Like, who is Emma outside of your family and your work and your podcast and everything else? And and that's not something that you have to necessarily share with the world. You can keep that part to yourself. But those moments of spending time alone and getting stoned by the ocean and listening to really great music, those are the moments when you look back in 100 years, you're going to be like, yeah, I had fun. <laughs> and and nobody else, like, especially now with the way the technology works, nobody else needs to know that nobody else is on the other side of the phone. You can have those out loud conversations without worrying about other people judging you or deciding whether or not you're mentally stable. It doesn't matter as long as you're having a good time getting to know who you are. That's so true. It's so true. <laughs> well, listen, tell our listeners uh, where they can find you online, where they can connect with you. So I'm on Twitter at Devin J. Hall, and you can find me at loudmouthbrowngirl.com. And I'm on Amazon and Goodreads and Instagram, and I'm all over the place. All the usuals, as Devin J. Hall. As Devin J. Hall, yeah. Great. Well, I'll link to those in the show notes. Well, Devin, listen, thanks so, so, so much for joining me. I've found that really, um, really enlightening. And really, even though you've Thank been you. writing about a dark subject, I found talking to you very uh, uplifting. And I love <sighs> your very positive approach to Thank um, you. tackling those difficult times of life, those great areas. So thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you found that helpful and inspirational. Now, don't forget to come on over to Facebook and join my group, Turning Readers Into Writers. It is especially for you if you are a beginner writer who is looking to write their first novel. If you join the group, you will also find a free cheat sheet there called Three Secret Hacks to Write with Consistency. So go to emmadesi.com forward slash turning readers into writers. Hit join. Can't wait to see you in there. All right. Thank you. Bye bye.